hate to break the fishing news up, Graham Chuck, but I'd like to speak about the ice hockey. Congratulations. You're one of the 13 listeners of the Real Life Podcast. We just traded a migraine in for like an orgasm. You might want to mark that down. Yeah. Here yep. Yep. All of my projects are on schedule until they're not. A member of the Nation Network of Podcasts. About as funny as we're going to get today. Welcome in to a new episode of the Real Life Podcast delivered by DoorDash. 25% off and zero delivery fees on your first order of $15 or more. All you need to do is download the DoorDash app and enter the promo code NATION25. Jay, not here. Bag Milk, not here. Chalmers, not here. Wanye is here. It's just the two of us. This is great. How does this even happen? This is awesome. Yeah, I mean, I think we're... Gonna have a good episode. This is what happens in Menudo right before they replace all the members with younger ones. It's like suddenly they go to a concert and only like the two main ones show up. And you're like, hey, what happened to the other three? And then the next concert you go to, the other three are different people, but no one notices because Ricky Martin's still there and the other famous one. Mm, I understood basically none of that. Reference. You don't know what Menudo is? Uh-uh. I know who Ricky Martin is. Ricky Martin was in the thing called like NSYNC. It oh. was called Menudo. And he was so popular, he left, like Justin Timberlake did. NSYNC. You're familiar with NSYNC? Yeah, I know a little bit about it. Oh, I'm also very, sorry, I'm rattled right no, now. No, I know you are. You're looking everywhere. Because this studio is not the same as how I left it the other day. What's the problem? The TV's darker. Okay. That I can one see. of the lights was gone. Gone. Yeah, there's usually one right there in the middle. Okay. Um, the roadcaster wasn't plugged in, Who and it f- was in a box. You know what Wanye Jr. says anytime something weird happens? He Mm. goes, did the Grinch do it? Example, this morning, could not find the lid to his bottle. He's like, did the Grinch take it? I'm like, probably. So where are the lights? The Grinch probably took them. I like that as a fallback for a kid. Just like only really knowing one bad guy. That's in his head, though. Like He asks me, did the Grinch do it? Yeah, bless his heart. We saw Declan Kruger out from 1440. Mm, Good lad. Yeah, and uh, we were grocery shopping, the three of us, me, Wanye Jr., Declan. And he goes, hey, Wanye Jr. And Wanye Jr. stops and goes, why did that man just call me that? And I was like, there's too much to explain. Everybody part ways. (laughs) This is going to take forever. We don't have time. You're going to have a similar thing, I would imagine, than when like famous people's kids grow up where they probably have to be like, listen, this is who I am. Like, you're going to hear stuff about me so the kids just don't start Googling it. The only benefit you'll have is if your child just starts Googling Wanye, it might be a confusing Google. It would search. be. I would always deny whatever he's asking me. That'll okay. be my strategy. I'm not going to promote him and say, this is how life is, son. I'm going to be like, no. Daddy, what? I don't know what this guy talking about. This guy. What? Who? Yeah. What? I don't worry about it. Who knows? Stop being public. Yeah. When yeah. now as a man who's recently engaged and congratulations, there's only mm-hmm. two of us here. We're having yeah, a private, we had to for traumas. We have to get that in every single time. Private conversation. How did everybody take the good news in your life? Was oh, everybody in my so life? happy? Oh yeah, it was great. It seemed like a real ground spring of positivity when you announced it. Yeah. No one like came out of the woodworks and tried to, you know, say anything weird. Um, I think generally reception, pretty positive. Um, she's still very happy. Yeah. You know? I, I played it smart where it was like a month before her birthday. So again, leading into the birthday, I had, I have no pressure on me. I think for like a calendar year, I bought myself a solid run of goodwill. Most people I know who get engaged, Tyler, don't report a lifetime of pressure-free living afterwards. They say 10 years in, God dang. Yeah. I think at some point that pressure will return to my life. But for now, I think I'm close to pretty good. good. Bubble? This is like the fun part, right? We're just going and like looking at venues. We're looking at stuff. By the time it comes time to be like, okay, we now need to pay like tens of thousands of dollars for this whole thing. Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. You're a hustler. Yep. That is usually how I go. I'm trying to get a new fence for my backyard. I That's heard you there. Hustle, I yeah. thought Durashield was a uh, guard. Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. I thought it was a condom company. And then you were like, I need a new fence. And I was like, why would the condom company pay for that? <laughs> they just, they, they're like, hey, and as a part of the ad deal, we're going to do one solid for your rem chuck. Whatever he needs. He's going to wear them or not wear them for a year. Whatever the case may be. Yeah, but we'll do him a solid at some point. It's like, oh, cool. Can You're thinking of Durex. One time I went into a, uh, I worked at a golf store and this guy came into the back shop where I was regripping shoes and he asked for the manager of our store who was mildly shady. Okay. And he goes, uh, is that guy here? I'm like, no. He's like, oh. He was going to put a whole set of King Cobras in a bag together for me. And it's a golf store. So, of course. Yeah. So I go around and put it all together for him and get the end. He's like, OK, so this is an exchange for his driveway I'm pouring. And I was like, what? The boss traded you shoplifted golf clubs for a new driveway? And I was like, I'm in over my head. I shouldn't know this. So I made him call on Monday. 
And was it actually, that I was, didn't, you have uh, no idea. Look, I can't be getting mixed up in these backroom politics. I'm 14 years old in this story. I'm trying to make a name for myself. When I worked at Jersey city, um, the big push was always to get people to sign up for the club card. Of course. And it was very easy to do when their purchase was like basically over a hundred dollars or like more than 60 bucks on hats. Cause then it would be like, Hey, the club card's going to cost you $6, but on your purchase today, you're going to save 12 or 10 uh, if it was a hundred bucks. Right. So it was always like, yeah, and then you can use it for the full year and like whatever. So it was a very easy sell. A guy came in once who worked at another store in the mall and he was buying his son a Jersey. And I was like, Hey, if you sign up for this club card, I can save you like 15 bucks on the Jersey and you get the club card for the year. And he thought I was cutting him the sickest deal ever. <laughs> he was just like over the top and like, man, like this is awesome. God, you're coming through for me so good. Here. And I'm like, dude, I offer this to literally everybody. The guy's like, okay. I am winning. So then at his store, he was like, anytime you want the employee discount, you come on in. And he's like, you come in, I'll give you everything. It was like cost plus 5%. Yes. Like it was a actually good discount. I was getting stuff. I was getting clothing for very cheap. Um, and then every time I'd go to pay, he'd just be like, Hey, just don't use a visa card. Cause they can track whose visa card it is. He's like, just use a debit card. And then they don't know. It's not me using this discount. I remember the era where y'all got jobs, all your friends. And then it was like, what can your friends jobs do for you? Yeah. Like I had a friend who worked at a driving range and we'd go up there and he'd just wink and put his finger on his nose and we'd go hit balls till our hands exploded. Be great. Right? You got a friend working at the Jersey store. You can hook it up. Yep. But yeah, that guy worked there for maybe another four months and I went in one day. I'm like, hey, is so-and-so in? And they were like, uh, no, he doesn't work here anymore. I was like, hmm, I think I know what happened. I think they figured out he's been like manipulating the discount program, but that's fine. So on that topic, listen to this. Nobody else is listening to the show but us. Mm. I'm working at the golf store. Yeah. I've now been there three years. I'm 17 years old. One day they go, oh, hey, can everyone please come in on a Saturday morning for a company wide meeting? And that happened all the time. We came in. There were like two auditors waiting there. Oh, no. And it turns out there was massive shoplifting going on with the staff and like shady deals afoot, except for 17 year old Wanya, who doesn't understand how the world works. Yeah. And it was like everybody in the room got murdered except for me. And then one of the auditor guys came to him, came to me and was like, son, you're a real honest guy. We've been watching. We had cameras put in. This is like before cameras were everywhere. So they were really like cracking down. He's like, would you like to be assistant manager of the store? And I went home to my parents. And I was like, I'm an exemplary employee. And they've asked me to join management. And they're like, if you think you're going to work full time at a retail store at 17, you're going to be out of this house. And I went back to the guy and I was like, my parents won't let me. And he goes, parents, how old are you? And I was like, 17, sir. And, and he, he was like, like, oh, he thinks like, I thought you were like 23 years old. He's he like, went, offer rescinded anyways. Yeah, you're a child. It's illegal. It's just child labor. <laughs> so uh, I think that's the fun of retail though. For a lot of people, it's like, what can I get away with as a youth? Yeah. Um, I remember we had a guy we hired at the Jersey shop and this is when I was a key holder. So, you know, a little bit of clout, not assistant manager. Can you get into the mall though. with a key? I could get into the store, but like after hours in Kingsway, were you able to somehow it was gain? West Ed. So West Ed's pretty much always oh, 24 open. Hours, you, yeah, 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 you can yeah. basically just walk in whenever you want there. So you could get into the store though with all the jerseys. Yeah. And I had to carry the deposit at the end of the day. Well, that's uh, no joke. That's no joke. Um, we hired a guy and he was a big fan of a certain NFL team and he was stealing. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. He was stealing. And we realized that when we did inventory and we're missing a handful of things that were all his, Cincinnati Bengals yeah, gear. Like yeah, his yeah. favorite team. Sure. He was like a Niners fan or whatever. And we were only missing Niners gear. And I was like, that's a little weird. And then as he got a little bit more comfortable going on, cause we couldn't prove anything. We didn't have him like on footage or whatever. Um, as we got more comfortable, he started following us on Instagram, like personally, like, ah, oh, we're friends and we work together. And he had pictures of himself wearing the shit we're missing. And then he came in the next day. I'll never forget my manager, like saw him coming and just walked to the front of the store and like stopped him and was like, you're gone. And he was like, yeah, that's fair. He like, didn't, he was just like, I have been doing that. Yes. <laughs> and just like accepted that he had been fired. You're not allowed to do this sort of shit. People <laughs> it take it rough. from a 17 year old Wanya. You want to play it straight and you could be the assistant manager at Kingsway in the Bay of Nevada Bobs. There was a Nevada Bobs in there the was Bay. then. Damn. I think the Bay went out of business and Nevada Bobs went out mm. of business. Are they still around? Maybe in the States. Nevada Bob's, I think for a brief little bit was also inside of sport checks. And then I think that was like their last gas. So we were, were done. We, cause I yeah. was assistant manager. Just I don't know if yeah. I just told you, yeah. uh, we were purchased by sport check. I think eventually. Yeah. Like they I were publicly traded. Hmm. 
I do think everyone should work. Everyone should work retail or serving at one point. In their I've lives. done both. That golf job was my favorite job of all time. Yeah, it was. I I like the the retail job because like you can yeah you can push what you can get away with. Like on Sundays, I would set up a ladder and pretend I was like cleaning hats and shit, and I'd just be watching TV. And someone would come in and be like, oh, "I'm dusting the hat rack." And I'd be like watching TV. No one knows how long it takes to truly dust a hat rack. If you were a good Nevada Bobbian, as we were called mm-hmm. at the time, you were allowed to work during the winter. Oh, so like summer, it's every day's gravy. There's people buying teas. It's yeah. great. But like, who gets to work November 11th at two, you know, in the yeah. afternoon? When maybe four people will come in during the whole day. day. Yeah. So we had a Callaway rack that had a TV in it, and we would watch movies in the Callaway rack. That's all we did. Oh. And you'd come to work, and there's nothing better than an easy job when you're a kid. You're like, I don't have to do anything all day long. This is the greatest thing ever. Like, are yeah. you bored? Why don't you go fuck yourself? <laughs> I think about that now. I'm like, if I had to go back and do that job, the amount of just like staring aimlessly and like, that is what I love about this job. There's never a point where I'm staring at the clock being like, God damn, almost five, like almost quitting time. It's usually just like mayhem for six hours. And I like that because it keeps my mind constantly busy. hundred percent. I'm getting to talk a lot too. Anymore. Yeah. Getting to talk a lot's fun. I, I think. Yeah. When I had my first office job right after uni, they're just, I remember everyone telling me to shut up all the time. Like people from my hallway coming down and being like, you stuff. have to be quiet, man. I'm trying to do stuff. And I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like, kid, I have no earthly idea. Here you can come in, wave your arms, talk loud. No do whatever you want for a few hours. I'm like, all right, well, that was fun. <laughs> and we're publicly traded. And, Two. and we are just like traded. Nevada Bob's. You don't think they're going to put us in the bay, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Doing shows from the bay makes n- it just d- wouldn't make sense. But we're, we're doing it. Speaking of shows, I swung by the nation party on Saturday and saw a very good time underway. I've been with this company, well, whatever, since I was 21. So that means I'm 26. I've been to, I'd say 90% of the events in that span. It's my first time ever seeing you outside of this office at a work event. I'm trying to keep it tight and not be so, in it was so funny. Like you walked in and it was just like double take, like, holy shit, he's here. My boy was having his birthday and he mm-hmm. called me. He's like, hey man, I'm going to the nation thing for my birthday. Hey. And I'm like, oh, and he's like, and this guy's coming and this guy's coming. I'm like, oh, and he's like, is there any way you could find your way to your own party for once, you fucking weirdo? And I'm like, okay. I had a great time. I do think, though, it's like bag milk always comes to those events, yeah. right? And now it's like the worst kept secret is like bag milk. You can show up and like piece it together sure. if you're smart enough. With you, I like the idea that you actually could have just roamed around that party and did and not a soul. Not a soul. That's good. It is good. It's the best way to do it. Yeah. Then you go places and you've got like people orbiting you like electrons wanting to talk to you. Yeah. Or the thing that always makes me laugh is like at Oilers games where I'll be like walking or I'll be standing in line piss or like piss and people will be walking past me and I'll hear them be like, that was your M truck. (laughs) And I'll be like, yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. Or like, I think that's the Oilers nation guy. It's like, well, why would I be here at the game? Like, huh? (laughs) Because you're mingling with us boobs. You're not up in the media room. Um, what did you make of the Oilers nation event? I think it's fantastic. Greta is especially on a weekend when we do them, like during the playoffs, sometimes when we're on a weekday, you'll get like a random Tuesday where it's like, ah, the bar is like 85% full. But on Saturdays, it's like, hundred percent full it and it bangs and you guys doing the show afterwards was great too on site i think that's a nice value add yeah i think especially yeah people walking around seeing it put it up on the tvs and whatnot and they fucking won for which once. is huge yeah um i love that clip of Corey perry sitting on the bench at the end of the game looking at the flames just being like you're bad and connor laughing at him as he yeah. walks past that that's beer league hockey energy sitting and just telling the other team they're bad after you beat them sitting Very on funny. the boards just yeah. smug like everyone else celebrating down with Stuart skinner Corey perry's like infinitely better use of my time to sit here and tell them they're bad it's interesting to see Corey perry establishing himself on the bench and establishing himself here in edmonton he's been here what now three four weeks five six weeks yeah yeah and like, what did you make of him yelling at Kane on the bench? Did you see him afterwards in the presser saying brothers fight? What'd you think of that? I think it's fine. Cause I think it's actually kind of true. And I think Perry and Kane have kind of shown at different points that they do actually like each other. So yeah, I, I don't know. I think again, if everybody wants to win and it's highly competitive, like that shit's going to happen. I think about decade of darkness when they would show so many nights, they'd go to the length of the bench and every single person was just sitting there staring blankly into space. There was no disagreements on those teams. There were no super competitors that really wanted to win. It's interesting to see a guy like Corey Perry, who seems like a real competitor, doesn't he? Yeah, man. And like, that's the best part about having a guy like that in the bottom six is like, he's won a bunch of times before. Yeah. Um, 
and he again he's been around long enough that his name carries clout like i'm sure if you were evander kane and like not to be like whatever just like what if like ryan mcleod is like make a better play yeah. why is his voice like the kid from yeah. and you're probably just like shut up yeah so how about that but like when it's Corey perry sure. guy who's won like gold medals is like be smarter i think if you're evander kane that's probably a little bit of like oh yeah I, I should, but maybe he'll smart. rise to the occasion too. I don't know how Vander Kane responds to being called out, but it didn't seem like unprofessional. Then to say that they're brothers afterwards, and like, Kane was joking, being like, "We're partners in the Masters pool this week." Is that he said? Yeah, he, he, <laughs> Kane. Uh, so Perry does his media veils like we fight like brothers, whatever. And then I guess when Perry was walking away from the scrum, he yelled at Kane and was like, "Kane, are they ready for you?" And Kane was like, "You're an asshole." <laughs> and then did his media veil and was like, "We're fine. We're partners in the Masters pool this week." So. Is this how champions behave? I think so. Oh my God. I think that is like a good, and again, the avalanche, I mean, good team won a cup earlier in the season. They had Devin Taves going to the media being like, we have a bunch of guys who are prancing around playing like everything's fine. And they're not putting it like this shit happens. I don't know. I do like how, whenever there's like the small, the smallest thing goes wrong in Edmonton. And I mean, I'm guilty of it too. I I do it a lot, but it's like the world's ending, right? They lose one game to Dallas and it's sorry. We built a company on this. Yeah. And that is the beauty of the fan base is that it's passionate, but it's like, they lose five, nothing to Dallas. And everyone's kind of like, well, the season's kind of cooked now. Like we're done. It's like, Oh no, they've been the best team in the NHL for like six months. I'm sure it'll be generally okay did you see that infographic that was out today that showed the oilers rise from the bottom mm. of the nhl this year that was unbelievable that is like insane american thanksgiving they're 30th in the nhl and what's the stat it's like if you're you could be a point out of the playoffs on american thanksgiving and you instantly lose like a 40 percent of your chances of making the postseason and it's like for them to do this and just be so consistently good like the heaters were one thing but they well, in that lost- chart they're just like beep 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 beep, beep, beep crazy man because when they lose they're not losing like four or five in a row no does this kind of rejig because this is how i know i watch too much nation stuff is like now i think what you think so (laughs) i'm like oh when your m chuck two years ago said that the team was fucked on american thanksgiving remember i remember sitting over there and being like we're done your m chuck's never wrong then when he tweeted it was the end of the mcdavid era i went and looked out the window and i was like we're done your m chuck's never wrong now that you've seen two years where they were two years in a row out at american thanksgiving but the problem is that they keep finding like a deeper way to go early. Like again, two years ago, I was expecting like, okay, they're a perennial playoff team. Now yeah. they just go play consistent hockey and make the playoffs. I'm not, I'm an Oilers fan. I grew up. My formative years were decade of darkness. We're like you said, we're used to guys just staring off from the bench and being like another four, one loss to Minnesota. This sucks. You don't know what it's like. To and I'm sitting at home. Like the world championships are just as good as the playoffs. Think of the honor of playing yeah. for your country. Everyone loves wearing the team Canada Jersey. What a great then. time this is going to be. Um, but right. Like you're, you don't know how the day to day grind goes of just being a normal playoff team like there are shitty stretches in it so that first time when it was like okay it's american thanksgiving they're out of the playoffs it's like well this is exactly like every other year i've ever seen and we miss by 15 points in all those years so we're probably screwed and then this time coming around it was like okay well they're not just like eight points out of a playoff spot like they were last season they're 12 16 points out of a playoff spot and it's american thanksgiving and you read all the numbers and you're like well unless they go on some sort of insane run like they're fucked. And now they could win the Pacific division. It's like, what? It is an incredible thing to witness. One of the things I like to talk to other sports fans about of other teams and other sports, um, I'll be like, Oh, have you, like you've won a championship. Yes. Mm -hmm. Were you a big fan of your team? The year you won? Yes. Did you think the year they won, they were going to win? Oh, with the exception of Patriots fans. I've never spoken to somebody who thought realistically throughout the year they were going to win. It was like, no, like just as the year went along, they started to have a few good moves go. And then they got in the playoffs and a couple of good things happened. Like a lot of fans of championship teams didn't see it coming. Yeah. And it's not like, again, you're going to in the Oilers this year. It's not like they're just going to walk into the playoffs and like flip a switch and just like beat the shit out of everybody and roll. Like they're going to be down two one in a series at some point. They're going to go into overtime. Oh, just they're shivering. Thinking right, they're going to get blown out. Remember the yeah. first year after the decade of darkness against San Jose in game five of that series, or was it game four of the series? They got blown out. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like they got the shit kicked out of them and they bounced back and ended up winning the last two and then boom, they win the series. So playoffs sadly are for me a very unhappy time usually because like when they lose one game, even if they win two after that, I'm still like, but that one game though, man, we just got shelled and like very hard unless you're going to be sweeping every series to not be down. Like you said, 
How excited are you for these playoffs? I'm very excited. Like again, last year I didn't have like a good vibe for whatever reason. And against Vegas, like, I don't know. I just was annoyed with having to play Vegas. I guess I don't like the Vegas golden Knights. And by the end of that series, I was just like, God damn, like, I don't think this team's got it. Like put them out of their misery to an extent this year. I don't have that same feeling. Cause I think they have had a couple of things break their way this season. I think Stuart Skinner is going to be better. Obviously, Corey Perry falls into your lap. That's all good. I think the West, there are teams that can beat the shit out of each other, and that could lead to things getting more unpredictable as it goes on, which will work their way. I don't know. I'm excited. I'm excited again for playoff hockey. I feel like if there's one thing the Oilers aren't as a team who's in their fifth consecutive year making the playoffs, which is amazing. Yeah. They're not complacent this year. Yeah. They were at the bottom of the goddamn ocean, what, November 18th, right? Yeah. So it's not like they haven't played a game all year that's mattered. They actually had to play their way back into the playoffs in quite a considerable fashion. Whereas a lot of teams, you know, the whole regular season doesn't necessarily mean anything, right? Mm-hmm. These guys have had to, like, work to get to where they are. This might be the year, man. Yeah. But the other thing, too, about the Stanley Cup playoffs is, like, the true, like, the on-paper best team basically never wins outside yeah. of when Tampa Bay, I guess, has now done it a couple times recently, but like you also need a shitload of luck to go win a Stanley cup. Like you can go back through a lot of teams. Look at Florida. They marched all the way to the cup final last year. I think Boston hit a post in overtime of game seven of round one. Yeah. You're like literally an inch away from your season ending there. Never mind the fact that Florida doesn't even get into the playoffs last year. If Pittsburgh doesn't choke to the Chicago Blackhawks in game 81. So like lucky break there lucky break in round one. And then, I mean, they turned on the jets played really well for a little bit, but like every year, the team that wins the Stanley cup, you can usually point something in the first two rounds where it's like they were this close from going home. This is why Sidney Crosby wears the same cup. He was wearing an Adam because <laughs> you- they're so superstitious that when you try that hard at something and devote your entire life to it, but realize how much it comes down to luck. Yeah. You too would wear the same cup for 30 consecutive seasons. Yeah. Uh, remember that year. Uh, Philly went to the cup final and it, the last game of the regular season, they played the Rangers and it was winner of game 82, got the eight seed and they had to go to a shootout. And with their, I think they had to play their backup, Brian Boucher, that game for whatever reason, like an injury. So with their backup in game 82, they won in a shootout to make the playoffs <laughs> and then went all the way to the Stanley cup final. The That's best. wild. That's the best. And that shows parody in the league too, right? Like any yeah. team with a couple breaks can just be horses on fire right? yep. out of the barn. I think this is the best team of the Connor McDavid era. Bouchard's better than he was last year. You had a full year of Matias at home. I feel like Skinner's better than Smith. Yeah, Skinner's. I'm trying to think of that one. Corey Perry now. You've got also Henrique's looked great for depth. I think Henrique's good. And getting both those guys for effectively nothing. Vogel's having a better year than he did last year. So you can look at that as an area where they're better. Hyman is somehow having a better year than he did last year. Connor's El Fuego Muerte, which is a term I just invented to mean on fire till death. He has 99 assists. That's like the least talked about thing ever. Matthews needs like eight goals in his final four games to hit 70. And all they'll talk about is like, well, make two hat tricks and then a two goal game. And Matthews can hit 70. McDavid's like on the verge of doing something that hasn't been done in 20 some years. And they're like, eh. I remember being at the game when Doug Wade got a hundred points. Yeah. Okay. I can't remember what year that was like 98 to 90, 97, 98, 99. Somewhere. I'm a little kid jubilation is the only term I can think of. Like people were throwing their hats. Everybody's just spraying beer. Like so excited with Connor. It's very different. It's like, you got a hundred points. Yeah. Are we going to have any fun? No, because it's not fun. It's serious. And everybody's serious and he's serious and I'm serious. Try settle got a hundred points. Everyone was just serious. Kind of yeah. It's I do. strange. It's, it's what I, and I love Connor McDavid. He's my favorite hockey player. There isn't even a question to it. There is an element of him that's hard to be beloved because he doesn't include he he doesn't seem like he's winning when he does it. He's just like, this is implied. But that's why I really love the few moments we get where he is like truly fired up about something and the playoffs are 
always a great example. Like when he scored that winner against the flames and that he has like his little pre-planned celebrations, like the one knee, the the best. he has like his go-tos that he'll do when he scores a big goal. But even then, if he shows emotion and he does one of those like classic Connor celebrations, you're a little bit like, okay, you're you're cranking it up because yeah, big goal and you know, it's a big goal. So like whatever, when he scored against Calgary and the way he was like yelling and shaking his fists on the ice, it was like, whoa, that was one of the few moments it feels like where like you could tell that meant so much to him as a person to like score that goal and come through in that moment. Remember he came down the tunnel too, right? And he was, yeah. And him and and Shore were hugging each other. As Connor's evolved, I think it's, it's obviously a very difficult life to be Connor McDavid. Yeah. Right. Imagine being like 12 years old and being Connor McDavid in like Newmarket, Ontario. And every game you go to little kids are like, we're going to fucking kill you. (laughs) We're going to slash you so hard. You little shit your whole life. And you're already kind of a dork. Right. So you got like, you probably don't have the easiest time interacting with your peers because your lights out good. (laughs) Fast forward to now, like I remember when he entered the league and he wouldn't even say he was going to make the team. Do you remember that? Yeah. I think another side too, like you talked about him maybe being like awkward socially and whatnot for a big chunk of his career. You also after or of his life, you have to remember like every hockey camp he went to, what is he doing? Playing with kids three, four years older than yep. him. Right. What's Who he want to kill him? Well, they're that, not yeah. supportive of young Connor McDavid. And even they're the haters. guys on your team, like when you're 12 playing with 16 year olds, I think that automatically makes you shy walking into the room and a target to get yeah. murdered. And as a self-preservation thing, you're probably a little bit distant, right? But as Connor's evolved and as he's gotten more comfortable in his skin and as he's established himself, even already, some of the records this guy's putting up, I know. like it's preposterous to think that how lucky are we as Oilers fans to have a second Gretzky come through, man? There are going to be like, assuming health, knock on wood with Connor, he's going to be the second player to ever hit 2000 points in the NHL. So there'll be two players who've ever done that in the NHL. And captains both of the Oilers. Been captains of the Oilers. Just nuts. One day when we find out this is a simulation and we're talking to the architect, like in the matrix, they'll be mm-hmm. like, did you honestly think you got a second Gretzky or was this just for you? I'll be like, you're right. Statistically, it would have been impossible to get the other it one. It makes no sense. Like, that's how you know it's a simulation. Stupid. Your stupid hockey team got the best guy. And they keep putting them in Edmonton. Yeah. Like, you would never get to keep him if this wasn't a simulation. I do love, again, there are weird people who tweet stuff at me all the time. Um, and one thing I get a lot is whenever I send out a tweet being like, ah, refs aren't good tonight. Or like, oh, that was a bad call. There are people who are like, well, of course they're playing an American team. Don't you know when they play American teams, Bettman wants the American team to win. And I always think Oilers fans who could think that the NHL is conspiring against Canadian teams. If they have the ability to do that, if the league is smart enough and they can line everything up so that the referees work against Canadian teams and don't tell anyone else, then they would rig draft lotteries. And if they could rig draft lotteries, why would Connor McDavid be in Edmonton? I want you to rethink that. If they can rig draft lotteries, that's why Connor McDavid's in Edmonton. But that doesn't make sense. You don't sell more jerseys when he's in Edmonton. You would sell infinitely more jerseys, have infinitely more TV viewers if he was in an Eastern Conference team. Unless you were given a cold fusion wallet with 200 million in Bitcoin on it. Yeah, but I don't know if it was as simple as getting a large chunk of money from an owner to wink and rig a draft lottery. You don't think the Crosby draft lottery was rigged? No, because at, at the at the time Pittsburgh was dead. That's why they got him. But then why would it have been rigged for Edmonton? Because it I well, we can't say because chances are people are listening. So here here's what all we right, like if all it took was a rich owner, like James Dolan would have paid for a first overall. I don't think he would have wanted it as much as Mr. Cates. I, I think Mr. Know. Cates is like, I want a new arena. I want a Connor McDavid. I don't think it's as simple as bribing Gary Batman. You know what'd be funny though if the NHL didn't add like this. Show Gary Bettman in like a Hugh Hefner silk pajama set with like an overcoat on it. And he's just sitting in bed and he's propped up and there's a thousand pillows behind him. And he's just watching a wall of the games going on and he's in New York and he's in bed yeah. and it's just on ice officials calling him the entire thing. Like <laughs> we got a goal here in Toronto disallowed. Uh, hi there. We got a situation over here in Calgary with a slash disallowed. And just what all the conspiracy theorists think it yeah. would be funny if Gary Bettman's hobby was sitting in bed in New York and fucking with all 12 games going on. That he's day. like calling Russ before the game. 
being like, you are going to call a trip with four minutes left tonight if it's yeah. a one goal game. And we're going to make sure Toronto doesn't win this son of a bitch. Like, you know that New York's playing, right? Right. And you know that I need them to win all the big games, right? Especially on Saturdays, right? Yeah. With six minutes left, I'm going to need you to call a slash against yeah. the Flyers. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, okay. Before we keep humming along, we need to step aside for a quick break. All right, back half of the show brought to you by Bet99. Get into the game with Bet99. They are Canada's homegrown sports book, and you can take advantage of things like same game parlays, player props, flash bet markets, also fast payouts and smooth transactions make them the number one sports book in Canada, according to Ledger. Did you hear what Rick and I are doing right now? No. It's betting talk. So, on Oilers Nation Radio, I looked at the Oilers schedule before the game against Colorado, and I said, I think the Oilers are going to go on a six-game winning streak right now. Oh. So you always hear those things. Like, there was, you know, the number NC State just went to the Final Four, right? Yep, yep. And if you would have started with $100 betting on NC State on the money line. $42 million. Line, yeah, it's something yeah. like that. So I'm going to try to do that with all, a six. All six. Oh, okay. But I'm going to stop after six. I'm not going to roll it. all wins over. Roll them all over. So Rick heard that and was like, I'm in. So Rick and I are squad riding this. It's great because now we text each other being like, oh, here's the good. bet slip. We're good to go. So it was. And again, so, someone today was like, that's not betting responsibly. It absolutely is. I'm starting with $50. I have a plan yeah. and I am executing my plan. If not, whatever. It was fun with Rick to have something and have are, $50. Are we going to slap 50 down each on the oil to win the cup again this year and go have these? I don't like that. Why? Because I don't think the odds are that great on them to win the cup right but now. But do you really want to have the Oilers win the cup and you didn't bet on them? I'll win enough in the aggregate. Oh, I want to bet. It's all I ever bet is with you every year and then make <laughs> and you, you chase me for it. Cup. And I make you chase me to pay um, you. But anyway, so put 50 bucks on them to beat the Avs. It turned into 8750 Put 8750 on them to beat the Flames. It turned into like 135 or something like that. I checked the slip. Okay. Against Vegas, they should be like minus 120 in that range, minus 130 maybe. So like $135 should turn into whatever. We'll call it 200. Rough math. You've now quadrupled your dough. Now quadrupled my dough, but the goal is six in a row. They're going to get Arizona on Friday. I'm going to push my luck if we get to there. And then we're going to bet on the puck line, which should double it or close to double it. And what are you going to be? Then you're pushing 400. Then we'll be sitting there with probably about 380 at that point. And then you get the Canucks where you should be again, somewhat close to even money on the Saturday. Your 380 would then turn into like somewhere just under 800. You're probably that like is a heavy duty bet with five wins in the bank. Yeah. The like I've, there's been things that I've put like a hundred, hundred and fifty dollars on before. That's usually the outer limits of where I push my betting. I'll be crap. I, I will be very tempted to stop this game with Rick. If I get to the point where I have like $700 off my 50 and they've won four games in a row for me. Um, but also there's a part of me that's like, no, I said six in a row and I'm, I'm, you can't look at it like that. I'm only looking at it like my $50 back in the day when we used to play sports, like, can we say sports? Yeah. Yeah. Well, like the old, the the old actual one. ticket. Yeah yeah. 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 What you used to do. And I worked at the bar and like, I would never really bet on sports, but we, I had buddies who would. Right. And this one year, I'll never forget twice. We've done this in our lives where my friends like, dude, the oil are on fire. I'm going to say the first time was 2003. Right. And so down the stretch, we kept doing double or nothing, double or nothing, double or nothing, double or nothing. And I remember we went to a game and it was like two, two, and it had no implications on the playoffs. It had no implications on anything, but we had it all riding on the game. And me and my buddy were so pumped because they scored. And like, I don't know, nobody's like really that happy. We were, I've never been so ecstatic in my life. The second time we did it, Remember when Nielsen, Cogliano, and... Uh, it was Gagne. It was Kidline. The Kidline. Yeah. Remember when they were like 17 and four down the stretch And that they year? won like four straight OT yeah. game. Like, yeah, they're piping hot. We were on Sports Select like crazy doing a running parlay, like just kept rolling it back in. And like, I think it's probably the same thing now with apps. Like you just go to the store, they give you your money. You're like, lay it on again, my boy. Roll it back. Let's that is roll. That's basically me with Bet99 right now and the Oilers money line tickets. It's like, I don't have to think at all. I'm not really getting into the weeds with any same game parlays. I'm just like, Oilers money line. They're winning six in a row. Don't overthink it. For me, the only value of sports betting is betting on the Oilers because they're the Mm -hmm. only team I would want to win. And it's only to compound wins. I would never, ever bet against them. No, I, I, there's a lot of people who like, you know, before game seven against the LA that one year is like, oh no, I went and put a hundred bucks on the Kings. What the fuck is the matter with you? But then the thinking is emotional hedge. If the you it's accepting that you have no control on the outcome, you cannot emotionally hedge an Oilers playoff series. You bitch. Whoever did that. These are the things in life that are supposed to hurt. Yeah, and I agree, but I think people who look at it and go like, "Yeah, I have no control over this. I'm going to be 
happy if the Oilers win and I'm willing to bet a hundred dollars for that happiness. Like I'm willing to pay a hundred dollars yes, yes. to be happy. I'm already game. happy when they win. I'm happier. I'm and thrilled, happy. whatever. I'll pretend like my drinks costed a little bit yeah. more that night. It's all good. If they lose, you know, the Oilers were probably like two to one or the Kings were probably like two to one underdogs for that game seven. It's like they lose then I'm going to turn my hundred into 300 and I'll be depressed, but I'll drink for free that night. I guess, I guess I can't do it though. I've never done that. I've never bet against one of my favorite. Teams. I could never, I could never bet against the Oilers. Never, ever, 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 ever. I bet on ever again, probably every Oilers game throughout the year. I have some <laughs> amount of wager on it, but there are nights where I'm like no money line tonight. That's fair. Like Hyman shop prop. Sure. Yeah. There you there, go. An absence of a in. bet. I'm not expecting them to go 82 and 0 every yeah. year because I'd be miserable, but like an absence of a bet is a bet on the Oilers. That is also fair. Yeah. Oh man, this Coyotes Arena stuff is so funny. Also, I get tweets. I was going to say, are you looking at your watch, watch for getting Coyotes Arena yeah. updates? What year is this? <laughs> the year 3000? Someone the other day was like, it's weird that you have other men's tweets coming to your watch because you need to see them that fast. And I was like, that's part of the job. I need to well, know. You got to have the breaking news. Um, Scottsdale's mayor says he won't support the Coyotes proposed new arena site. <laughs> Oh, darn. I loved when the Coyotes last week put out this thing being like, our future is in Phoenix. We have the, and they shared all the mock ups yeah. of the Phoenix new Coyotes arena. has a good sound to it. And they're like, here's the new mock up. We're going to create this many jobs, blah, blah, blah. And then you like read through and it's like the Coyotes are going to do this and plan or sorry, they we intend to bid on the land. So it's like, OK, you sent out all these little like, look at us, new arena. Look how good it's going to look. New jobs, blah, blah. And we intend to win the land off. We're hiring a guy to work the door and his name's Carl and Carl lives over. It. You don't even have the land. You can't hire Carl. And it's not even like it's just land that's there for you to go like, hey, this is how much it is like real estate transaction done. No, you have to bid and have like support and all of that. Like they you're go. embarrassing yourself in front of Josh Doan. Stop it. That Stop putting great, out fake arenas. That is a great story. Though. Don't do that. Josh Doan. Yeah. That's a great story. So cool. That to me, I don't know. I, I'm a big fan of storylines yeah. and like Josh Doan being like, no father, I will save the team in the desert. I love that storyline. And then for him to debut there one again, I, I, that's part it's sick and twisted. I, that's part of the reason I think they're gone. Josh Doan was like, not ready to come up to the NHL yet. But he when scored. You, I know, but he scored, but it's like, if you're on your last legs as a franchise, what do you do? You need a storyline. Put Josh Doan in the lineup. We're going to sell another thousand yes. Doan jerseys yes. real quick. Let's wow. This thing going. Well, maybe not because there's only like 2000 people at the game, but. But I think Arizona is doing what you want that organization yeah. to do, which is keep fighting, keep trying, keep making up sure. storylines. They drew an arena that took time and money. Yeah. I'm going back next week to watch the Oilers again. They just clip Rexall place and just put a photo of it next to the freeway in Phoenix. They're like, ta-da. It'll be done. You jerks. Yeah, they just carry it over. Yeah. Uh, but I'm going back next Wednesday to watch the Oilers play down in Mullet Arena again. Sick. But it could be that's their final regular season game. So that's the end. Of Mullet Arena. Well, if it gets announced soon that like it's whatever, even if it gets announced. They'll after, be there again next year, won't they? Frank, th Frank is pretty convinced it won't happen. Where does he think they're going to be next year? Utah. The Utah guy, Ryan Smith, which is also. I know. And he's very young or he's like cryogenically frozen. I saw a photo two. of him. I was like, what the he fuck? put out a thing today basically being like, uh, it was like a fan survey. What do you think our team name should be if we were to get a team? And Frank's point was. If you're getting an expansion team, this is doing it out of whack. Usually you get the expansion team like Seattle, like Vegas, right? Then there's like a year of you being like, we're getting a team. We're getting a team. And then you do the naming and you, you spread it out, right? The only reason for Utah to come out now and be like, we are doing our fan. They know they have the team or because, and again, Frank made a good point of like every expansion team, anyone who's ever bought a team, the ones that succeed play ball with the NHL and don't step out of line. Jim ball, silly rule, Jim ball, silly fucked around yeah, man. did the ticket drive announced yeah. the team name early and what came out immediately the nhl put out statement after statement being like nothing not happening not happening they came out and like adamantly opposed him right have you seen sort of interrupt this have you seen this blackberry movie no, on I cbc need to, he goes in in that movie and sh like freaks out at everybody and freaks out at gary bettman yeah and then he says i'm from waterloo as like a threat to gary bettman which i thought was great funny but continue. so this Ryan Smith guy has done nothing but play ball perfectly with yes. the NHL so far. That's why he's made it so far in the process. He doesn't go out and do that behind the NHL's back. No. So why would the NHL possibly allow that unless 
they know they might have to move them in a month. And the, a hedge. T- and the timeline is so tight that you need to be ahead of things. You need the team name, logos, marketing, all done behind the scenes. So they're making the jerseys already. Probably. Damn. So, and then Scottsdale's mayor coming out today and being like, oh, even if they win that land auction, they don't have the, my political support to do this. They're just going to do another referendum and shoot it down and be like, you're not building that arena here. One thing that always blows me away about like decisions and stuff is how often powerful people are making decisions behind closed doors. They come to the conclusion. Then the job is to sell it to the public. Yeah. So we know what we're doing. You're Gary Bettman. I'm Ryan Smith. The second one, not the first one. Yeah. And we know already we've already cleared all the hurdles. This team is going to Utah. Um, four months ago, Gary Bettman comes and says, we're not going to get this through the Scottsdale government. Like yeah. we're going through the pretense of trying to get this done. But like you said, we're going to need a new place for October. And Ryan Smith is like, fantastic news. I've been waiting. The fly has caught a trap. Like remember when they were trying to get the coyotes to move back to Winnipeg for so long. Oh yeah. And that was the holdup. They couldn't get the coyotes. They couldn't get the coyotes. Then when they switched it and said, can we get any team? They had the thrashers in like less than a year. Well, and I remember that it like seemingly came out of nowhere in one off season or like, in a two month stretch. Cause it was still before the draft. So it was about this time of year where all of a sudden you would TSN started covering it heavily and, and all those outlets started covering it heavily. And it was like, Oh, they might actually get them. And then boom, they got them. Okay. Do you really think it only took two months for that? The story I heard, and normally we would have these conversations hanging out and there aren't mm-hmm. anybody listening. So if any of these facts are wrong, I don't care. We don't, we take zero responsibility, zero responsibility. Yeah. But when I, I helped go and launch jets nation in Winnipeg, yeah, I went and talked to the true North people. They showed me the arena when it was still AHL and wasn't NHL yet yeah. and told me a bunch of shit. And they said that they're that Mark Chipman guy mm-hmm. that owns the team. He's in partnership with David Thompson. You know who that is? The, the, one of the richest men. In the- I think he's the richest man in Canada. Yeah. yeah. Thompson Reuters, the news agency. Yeah. When you look at like the publicly available list for like richest people in the world, he's pretty high up. Yeah. And so as the story was explained to me, I could be wrong. I don't know. But Chipman was like, I'm going to build a downtown arena when the Jets moved. And it was like when sentiment was at an all time low, the jets just left. Why would you build an arena now? We're yeah. fucked. And he's like, I see the impact this is having on Winnipeg. I don't like as a member of the business community where this is headed. We're going to build a downtown arena and we're going to put an AHL team in there and we're going to live our AHL lives. And they purposely made the rink smaller than the floor of what an NHL team had to have to be like, no, we're going to make concerts. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. So when Chipman was looking for part pieces of land downtown, David Thompson owns everything. He's just sitting there. So he got in contact with him and was like, here's the dream. We're doing a downtown arena. We're going to get a lot of concerts. We're going to bring Winnipeg back and put it on the map, even though we don't have a hockey team. David Thompson's like, I'm totally in for this vision. I'll, I got the land. I got the money. I got the this. I got the that. We should get an NHL team. And Chipman's <laughs> like, no, no, no. We don't need an NHL team. We're going to have the moose. Yeah. We're going to get Beyonce in this bitch. And he's like, cool. When that's done, we should probably get an NHL team. He's like, we don't want to tease Winnipeggers. So they kept working. They built the arena. They developed a really good relationship. And then they started working on the Jets. And they're starting to work on the Coyotes. And they're starting to work on the Jets and the Coyotes. And Chipman just couldn't get past. They wouldn't move Phoenix. So one day he had a meeting. Mr. Thompson was like, we're never going to get the Coyotes. And he was like, what if we just got a different team? He's like, well, we couldn't call them the Jets. He's like, what if we did? (laughs) He's like, just bring a different team to Winnipeg and call them the Jets. He's like. I think we could do this. And then Mr. Thompson phoned and then they got the, the uh, Atlanta thrashers. And that was funny too. Like looking back on that, how there was always so much talk coyotes, coyotes, coyotes. And again, it flipped like that. And, and they're that's like, we'll why, just call the jets. Cause I'm $47 billion David Thompson. Yeah. Oh, the coyotes is going to say they own the trademark. Yeah. Sucks. And Gary Bevin's like, we can make this happen, sir. <laughs> well, that's what's, I don't know. That's what's neat. I think what, when you get a guy like David Thompson, you get a guy like Chipman and you can reverse the damage of the team leaving. What a thing they did for Winnipeg. Yeah. Like I can remember when the jets left, my sister lives in Winnipeg and like her husband, like they were like crying and shit, man. Oh. And to have them actually come back in your lifetime. And the thrashers are suddenly called the jets again. It's like, there you go, kids. You've got your present, but it all worked out. It worked out great. Uh, before we wrap up, got to give some love to snow Valley and the aerial park. It's opening up May 31st and the rainbow Valley campground. The only campground in the city of Edmonton bookings are opening up and the campground will open its doors on May 15th. You can book today at rainbow dash valley.com or there's really golden nights on Wednesday. Quick thing about your wedding. Mm-hmm. I've been to a wedding at Snow Valley. It was mm-hmm. unbelievable. You should talk to them. It was unbelievable. Did you hear last episode when we talked about this? No, I wasn't here. It was you and uh, 
Didn't I miss last episode? I don't know. I feel like we, we haven't talked about Snow Valley because I went to my good buddy's oh, wedding yeah. there and it was, it was unbelievable. Hmm. Tempting. Get married on the tarmac at the Edmonton International Airport in between flights. <laughs> you say, Amber, we've got eight minutes. We got to have all the chairs set up, quick vows, because there's a 715 flight coming in from Toronto. We got to get out of the way. It is. I know people probably hate when I talk about wedding stuff, but it's part of my life. And this is called real life. Yeah. There was one venue we went and visited who was like, yeah, you can get married here, uh, like right next to like basically the parking lot. Oh. They're like, that's a, if it's outdoors, that's where you go. And we're like, okay. And they're like, and our staff will not assist in like building anything we're like okay so like the arch and stuff we get married under like we have to bring that ourselves the day before and they're like well you can't bring it the day before it has to be morning of it's like okay so morning of our wedding with all this hoopla yeah, we have to was, come oh, yeah. build our own arch or find someone to come okay annoying and we're like and what about chairs and they're like oh we don't provide seating you have to find somewhere to rent your seating from and bring it in and we're like okay will your staff set that up no so they go so why are you charging me money <laughs> Why are you charging me money to get married in your parking lot and you won't do anything for me? As your friend, Tyler, you're going to enjoy this. I, I can't speak to marriage if it's a good idea. I, <laughs> I assume yet you and Amber have a good relationship. I can't speak to that. Either of you could be cannibals. I don't know. <laughs> How long will you stay married for? I can't speak to that. As your friend, here's what I want for you. The lowest price wedding possible. Not because it sucks. But because the value you got for being Tyler, the Uram Chuck was so high. Oh, I was just thinking, that's what I, I want. I don't want to spend that much money on one day. The ring. It's crazy. As I, I've told you this before. Yeah, yeah. But I've never been so proud of anybody I've worked with my entire life that when you shouted out the sponsor, not Amber and you're engaged, I'm like, that's a man who understands how capitalism works. Big the business. only other time I've been equally happy is when Gregor in his wedding speech had sponsors. He shouted out in his own wedding speech. Oh, that's so good. It's so good. It's You'll never ring. get that money back. No. But if you can be you and get a deal on a ring or park at the EIA or, or do it at center field at the car races. Remax Best. Field. There you go. That would actually be electric. Remax Field would be great. Hmm. And do a little wacky little stunt midway through your vows. You got to go hit a dinger or something. Oh, this <laughs> wedding will not resume until Jay hits another home run at <laughs> Remax Field. Did he ever go yard? Yeah. It took us like three hours, but he went pretty good. Yeah. No, it'll be, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Get everything for free. That's what I'm cheering for for you. That would be funny. <laughs> Tell Amber's parents, like, hey, yeah, you guys can say whatever you want in your speech. You just have to do this ad read for Mr. Lube. You should punk them and say, like, I need you to hold up like a Jiffy Lube logo as you go down the aisle or something because they're putting in. And you both have to be in blue. That's your sponsor color. And you need to walk down in blue when you give her to me. And we'll say it's for like eco transport. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't be funny. Uh, well, that's that. Kid. Yep. That's a wrap. This is a good episode of the two of us. We yeah, did a me, good job. It was just me and you talking for 47 minutes and 20 seconds. And we talked about the Oilers. A lot about the Oilers. Actually. Got around to your wedding. Yeah. Fantastic. Which is a must. Mm -hmm. We're both promoted. Yep. All right. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. We'll talk to you again on Thursday.